Thanksgiving is a beautiful time to be with those you love. Turkey and all the trimmings abound, laughter is shared, the pig skin is passed, and naps are at their best. Since 1621, this has been a time in America to celebrate life's good harvest. Many of us no longer have to harvest our own food, but there is another harvest we should all participate in. Take this time to collect in your heart all the people and the moments you have had in your life this year that you can be thankful for. What do you think of? Your family? Your friends? Having a place to call home? Your job? Your health? Or just the simple fact that you woke up this morning and you are here, right now? These are all good gifts that come from one place. God. Often we can forget to thank Him for being the source of all the blessing we receive in our lives. Psalm 106 and 1 says, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. As you reap the harvest of blessings God has given you, take a moment, this moment, to thank God. Why? Because He is good and His love endures forever. Missionary Church. Glad to have you here today. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor, you can go on to the website and uh, click first-time visitor and we'll go ahead and make a donation in your name. Uh, prayer request, also go to the website or go to send an email to prayer at livingfaithmc.info or call the church and leave a message. Uh, announcements can be found on the website. A couple quick ones though. Poinsettia orders are needed by next Sunday. The forms are in the pamphlet rack by the West Doors. I'm not a local, so I have to trust that you locals know where your West is, because you guys seem to all do that. Anyway, West Doors that way. Hats and gloves. Brian, can you say a few quick words about the hats and gloves tree? Yes, we need adult male hats and gloves. That's where our group will shine. You're doing a really good job with the children. You've got them covered, I think. We'll give you more information later And as I get older, I understand that some of us need hats in the wintertime. I didn't, I didn't realize that until recently. So please go ahead, give us some hats out there. Uh, Faith Kids Coin Dump will be next, will follow the service next Sunday. Uh, and decorating the church will be December 5th at 9 a.m. So come on out, help decorate the church. Uh, finally, birthdays, Kay Satorius celebrates her birthday this Friday, so go ahead and give her a call and uh, let her know uh, that you're thinking of her. Also, just a quick side comment. Uh, less people in the, in the service today and don't know exactly why, but if you are concerned about viruses and COVID and all that, be strong, take, take charge of yourself, wear your mask, stay away from each other. Those are things that are important, but you need to make that decision for yourself. We're gonna stay open and continue to worship God but take care of yourself out there. And if you're sick, stay home. If you're not sick, come on in. But again, be smart. Take care of yourself. All right, let's go ahead and say prayer. Stand, please. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you today for bringing us here. Thank you for all the blessings you give us. Even this cold, freezing rain outside, Lord, it just shows that you've got a plan uh, for our world and for our lives. As we go through this world, and, and especially these times where there are so many fears out there, Lord, let us be smart and, and let us be cautious, but let us also understand that you are in charge and that we love you and, and we know that you love us. And so that what will happen will be your will. And we are there for you. And we want to go out and show courage in you, Lord. And, and what we learned today from Chris's service, let us take it out into the world let us help each other. Let us help those who are in, in need, in fear, who are in pain. Lord, we just ask that you give us the courage and the strength to spread your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, if you have your Bibles, open to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts 25. Um, I, I did have the verses up, but uh, technical issues occurred, and I didn't want to spend a half hour this morning trying to fix them. So the verses won't be up on the screen, so you'll need your Bibles, you'll need your phones, however you want to do it. Um, so please do that. Uh, just a quick note, obviously uh, we're not having a, uh, a community Thanksgiving service. Um, so what I have done is I have put together a video of uh, the, uh, it's about 16 minutes long, of the history of Thanksgiving. Um, talking about all oh, going back to the pilgrims, to mostly today. And so I put that together. Um, for those of you who don't have internet access, um, I have two video, two DVDs left. For those that you do have, that do get online and have uh, internet access, please do that. So I don't have to make more DVDs. But if you need one, please let me know. Um, it will be up on the um, YouTube channel on today, about five o'clock. It'll come on. You can watch it anytime you want. But uh, just a little fun video I put together about uh, the truth, and because I think sometimes we, in our society today, we forget the truth and forget history, and. Um, History is important, which is kind of what we're talking about today. It's history, but it's our foundation. So um, please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 25. Remember, Paul uh, has been in custody now for quite a while. It's actually been two years. Could you imagine being in, in custody? And he's got some liberties, but being in jail for two years, no charges brought against you. But every once in a while, the judge comes and says, hey, I want to talk to you for a while. Then he talks with you, he gets frustrated, he sends you back. Whew. I was going to make some comment about being married, but I'm going to get in trouble if I say that. Not for my wife, but from Becky, because she's going to come and smack me. No, it, it, it's interesting because Paul is doing this, and you can imagine, you can imagine the weight that's on him. You can imagine how, how he just sits and says, Why? You know, I'm sure he had times of prayer when he sat and said, God, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? And I'm sure we've all been at those places in our lives where we're like, why? Why me? And so we remember, why him? Why did Jesus die? Why him? But Paul is going to experience some things that, like I said before, he never would have experienced if he had not been arrested. Now, what has happened is that Felix is no longer the governor, no longer the, the head of it, head of that area. So now we have a new guy, and his name is Festus. A bunch of jokes just came to my mind. I'm just going to leave him alone. Um, his name is Festus, and he's going to take care of this. At least he thinks he is. So let's start with verse 1. It says, now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he would summon him to Jerusalem. <laughs> we know what they're wanting to do. Because they were planning on, to ambush him and kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, he said he, let the man of authority among you go down with me, and if there's anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. Which tells you that there have been no charges that could stick that were brought against him yet. After he stayed among them no more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought when he had arrived, the Jews had come down from Jerusalem, stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to these charges against me, no one can give me up to them. 
I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed. To Caesar you shall go. Paul had been a prisoner now for two years. And the new governor comes. And the first thing the governor does is he goes down to Jerusalem. He's trying, you know, would you not? I mean, when, when we first came here as pastor, I tried to visit as many people as I could. He wants to go down there and make a good impression. He doesn't want trouble. Remember, why? what's the major goal? What's the main goal of the Roman officials? To keep the peace. Because if you keep the peace, the money flows into the treasury. Keeping the peace is the most important thing. He wanted to get on well with the Jewish leaders. He, he, he took no time. The first thing he did was go and visit the Jews. And he stayed with them for many days. But he doesn't, I don't think he quite trusts them. Because he doesn't say, okay, I'll bring Paul down. He says, well, I'm going to go up and I'm going to listen to him. And you can send some people up and we'll, we'll figure this out. Now, the rulers of the temple wasted no time in bringing Paul's case up. Because you imagine, for now, not only is Paul in prison for two years and wondering why him and what's going on, but the Jewish leaders for two years have been stewing about this. I don't know about you, but do you ever get frustrated with something and then sit there and stew about it and stew about it and stew about it? Everybody's like, oh, no, I never do that. You know, I know we all do that. It's a human, it's a human characteristic. If we don't deal with something immediately, we stew about it and we talk ourselves into a lather. We get all upset instead of dealing with it. And that's what's happened here. So you can imagine these Jews are just chomping at the bit to tell Festus about Paul, this terrible guy, Paul, who they want killed. So they do. The new high priest was, uh, we know was called Ishmael. He had replaced Jonathan, who had been killed by Felix. Ishmael wanted to resurrect a plot from two years ago to remove Paul once and for all. Now, obviously, they want to kill Paul before he reaches Jerusalem. So, again, Paul finds himself on trial before the governor with the Jewish council as his accusers. And guess what? Their case hasn't changed. They still say the same charges, and all of them are without merit. They can't prove a certain one. Paul affirms his innocence. He's right back to where he was two years ago. Now, if that wouldn't frustrate you, I don't know what would. All this time, praying, 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 dealing with Felix and arguing with him and giving him, laying out the facts about salvation, got nowhere. And then he comes and finds himself in the same place again, and the charges haven't changed. It's still the same old story. Feel like you're spinning your wheels? Yeah, I'm sure Paul did. Festus, it's all that no progress is made. So he's going to ask Paul, because he wants to look good for the Jews still. He, wants to, he asks Paul if he's willing to be tried in Jerusalem. He's trying to ingratiate himself to the Jews in order to keep the peace. See, the thing is that a Roman judge could not move a case unless the accused okayed it. That was all part of the legal system. But Paul refuses to go. He claimed as a Roman citizen he is being tried exactly where he's supposed to be tried. It'd be kind of like saying, you know, you're in traffic court, let's say. And you're like, Your Honor, <laughs> I would much rather be tried in Washington, D.C. Well, no, obviously you wouldn't want to be tried in Washington, D.C. for a traffic violation. You want to be tried here. But that's what it would be like. That's what the Jews wanted to do. But Paul didn't want it, and why? First of all, we'll find out later that Festus was probably going to, you know, going to let him go, but he, he just, he couldn't, he knew he couldn't, he could not get a fair trial. So what does he do? He appeals to Caesar. This would be like appealing to the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. for a case that's valid. 
not for traffic violation. This is pretty serious stuff. He decides that I'm going to appeal to Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen. Well, first of all, Paul knew he wanted to get to Rome anyways. So why not? Why not go to Rome? He didn't want to go to Jerusalem. He had been there, and he figured the fast, probably the fastest way to get to Rome, probably the cheapest way to get to Rome, was by appealing to Caesar, because now they had to transport him. Second, Paul probably, he knew that he wouldn't get a fair trial down in Jerusalem, and they were trying to kill him. So the further away he gets from Jerusalem, the better he is. It's kind of like we, we sometimes have a change of venue of, of a court case. If there's so much media about a court case, they'll take it and they'll put it in another county or they'll put it in another state, hoping that the person will get a fair trial. I am kind of doubt that anymore with social media. It's very hard unless you're just completely blanked out from, from media and from electronics that you'll find out something's going on. You'll know, see something either in the newspaper or online or Facebook or whatever. I think it's kind of hard today to find people who at least don't know a little bit about what's going on. Still happens, but not very often. Because see, Paul is forcing the Romans to still protect him. Because if they had not been protecting him, he would have died two years ago. Thirdly, Paul realized that he would never get a fair trial in Jerusalem, so why even go through the process? Frustration. But before Paul's going to be shipped off to Rome, there's a problem. Festus still does not have a charge against him. There are no charges against him. There's a gentleman that I follow, and his name is Martin Armstrong, and um, I won't give you the whole story about it, but the federal government wanted to take a computer program that he had, and he wouldn't give it to him. So they arrested him because he wouldn't do that. Trumped up charges against him. They kept him, they kept him in jail for five years on a contempt of court charge. You don't do that. That's not, you can't do that. The federal government did. Um, he ended up appealing to the Supreme Court, and when, it, when they found out it was going to go to the Supreme Court, they dropped the charges and they let him go. It happens. It happens. But they need charges. He, Festus needs a charge, and there aren't any. So he decides to get some help. And it's just very lucky that somebody is coming who knows the area, who knows the Jews, and maybe could shed some, some light into this case. And we see that in verse 13. So now when some days had passed, Agrippa, the king, and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And they stayed there many days. Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders and the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had an opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So, when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the men to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss of how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem to be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. It's fortuitous that Festus and his sister, by the way, that's his sister, Bernice, this is Herod Agrippa II and his sister Bernice. They decide to visit Caesarea. Herod and Bernice were the last of the Herodian leaders. He is king by name only. Now, we all know about Herod the Great, right? Everybody, everybody nod your head. Herod the Great was the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was born. He's the one who rebuilt the temple, who refurnished the temple, made it bigger, did a lot of building projects. Herod was not Jewish, he was Indumean. He was part of Saul's, or part of um, Esau's line. He was a non-Jew, but he was king over them. That's why they hated him so much. 
So this is Bernice and Herod are the great-great-grandson and granddaughter of Herod the Great, who killed all the babies in Bethlehem. Great family line. Now, I don't want to spread any rumors about Agrippa and Bernice, but the rumors among Romans is that their relationship was closer than brother and sister, if you get my meaning. Which was another reason why the Jews hated the Herodians. Incest was look, is looked very <laughs> is shunned greatly by most civil societies, along with the Jews. Now Herod had jurisdiction over Rome and over the temple, so it makes sense that he would be able to hear Paul's case. Not to mention that the, the Herods always had a, had a strange obsession with Christians and with Christ. I mean, you know, it was, it was a Herod that killed John the Baptist. It was a Herod who tried to kill the Messiah when he was born. It's just kind of interesting. They would have known all about this. They would have kept track of what was going on. Festus knew there was no civil case against Paul. There was nothing that he could be charged with, but Paul was defending the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which was the key emphasis of the witness of the church throughout the book of Acts. So this is what happens when they sit down to meet with him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with a great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. It was very common for the Herods to do a lot of pomp and circumstance, to say. It's kind of like, I don't want to say it's like this because I don't think our presidents have been, uh, do this intentionally. But the tradition is when the president enters a room, everybody stands up. You pay a lot of respect to him. The song plays, hail to the chief, right? Everybody knows that song. He's the chief and he needs hailing. I don't think, I don't know what the words are, but that's what, that's, that's what we do. We honor them. That's what they're doing. They're coming in with all the pomp and circumstance. And Festus said to King Agrippa and all who were present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought to not live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving that death. So Festus is saying there's nothing there's no charges against him that deserve this. And as for he himself appealed to the emperor, and I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Now, could you imagine what would happen if Festus sent Paul to Rome without any charges? I'd be like your child. If, if Abigail comes to me and says, Daddy, Caleb did something, well, what do he do? I don't know. Well, then I'm just going to go spank him, right? I don't spank my kids now because I can hit back. No. I mean, I mean what, why are you coming to me and telling them when they did nothing? And that's what Festus is, is, is faced with here. But I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. He's figuring uh, Agrippa can figure it out. For it seems to me unreasonable to be sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Makes sense. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. Now, I'm going to read through this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because you guys have heard this over and over again throughout our, our study in the book of Acts. He's going to recount everything that has happened up to this point. You have permission. I says, so I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am making my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. He's saying... I'm not going to try to make you feel good about yourself, king. That's what he's doing. He's not doing. He's not, he's not trying to butter him up. But he says, I'm glad I'm before you because you know the customs. You know the discrepancies. He goes on, therefore I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known to all the Jews. They know who Paul was. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, which is the Pharisees, I have lived as a Pharisee, and now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers. He's saying it's not, it's not just because of Jesus, it's because of the promises made in the Old Testament. 
to which our 12 tribes hope and attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? He's saying, God can do anything. You shouldn't be surprised. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in the prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He was a terrible person doing these things. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when, that, when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and stand upon your feet. For, you have appear, I have, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to point you as a servant and to witness these things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness. That's what the gospel's purpose is. It's to open our eyes so that we will turn from darkness. So if you, if you hear the gospel and you don't open your eyes, you have your eyes closed. And I don't mean you're like walking around like this. I mean the eyes of your heart are closed. You're making a conscious choice. And even if you've heard the gospel and you've believed, but you don't live it, you are now living with the heart, eyes of your heart closed. So they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. There's only two sides, Satan and God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's what Jesus told Paul. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. It's not just about repentance. It's about living out the repentance. I can repent, but if I still go back to Satan doing the same way I did before, it's no good. What's the point? I repent and I live a repentant life. That's what he's saying. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. And to this day, I have, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus <laughs> said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. It's not the first time that's happened. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the, kings know, the king knows, Agrippa knows about these things. He knows the Old Testament. He knows the promise of the prophets. And to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would, that I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. He's saying it doesn't matter how long. You can hear a little bit or you can hear it for a lifetime. It doesn't matter. But it is God who changes a heart. Nothing I say will change your heart. It's the Holy Spirit who does it, not me. I'm just telling you what's in Scripture. That's why it's so important that we stay true to Scripture and we preach the whole Scripture. 
Because if not, then I'm trying to manipulate you with my words to get you to do something that you would probably wouldn't do. That's why the Bible is so important. Why we need to be reading it. Then the king rose and the governor Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. There's only one problem with that. I believe that if he had been set free, the Jews would have killed him. This was Paul's way of staying protected. It's amazing all the pomp and circumstance that goes on, the ceremony that goes on for this little Jewish man in a little corner of the world who preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what we're seeing is what God told Ananias. In when Paul was, when Saul was in on the road and he sees the light and he goes in and he's blind, and God sends Ananias to him to tell Paul what he needs to do. This is what God told Ananias. We go back to Acts 9:15. He says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You know, one of the ways you tell if a prophet is true and if a prophecy is true is when it comes true. You see an example right there. Jesus prophesied that Paul would be an instrument that would go before Gentiles, which he's done, before kings, which he's now done, and before the children of Israel, which he's done from the start. As Paul's sharing his story, Festus tells him he's crazy. Happened many times to Paul. Just like Jesus, they thought Paul was insane. They thought Jesus was insane. But in his response to Festus about the accusation, he reminds Festus that Agrippa is familiar with the facts. He's, he's the king of the Jewish people. He is responsible for Jerusalem and the temple. He knows the laws. He knows the prophets. He knows all these things to be true. He just doesn't believe. If Festus, had, Festus, nah, if Festus had thought that Paul was really crazy, he would have had him chained up and put away someplace. He wouldn't have put him on trial. He certainly would not send a madman to, to Nero because that's who he was going to be going to. He wouldn't send a madman to Caesar. Caesar was already mad enough. If you study your history, you'll know that. But Paul is not mad. And Festus is, is avoiding making a decision by accusing him of being mad. But not about his innocence, but about Jesus' lordship. Agrippa adopted a superior attitude, and he belittles Paul. And we see this in verse 28. See, what they didn't understand, what Paul, what Agrippa and Festus didn't understand was that now, you know, Paul was judging them. He was. He was judging them. They thought they were the judges. In reality, he was judging them, and they were the prisoners on trial. They had been shown the light. They had been showing the way to freedom. They have been told they, they know the truth now. But they had deliberately closed their eyes and returned to their sins. Now, they might have felt relieved. Man, let's get rid of this Paul. Get him out of here. Not my problem anymore. Right? Move it down. Move him out of here. I'm done with him. But see, their sentence was soon to come. And come it would. So what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing it is to have the opportunity to trust Jesus. To trust him for your sins. To forgive you of your sins. To say, I put them all on you. You died for them all. The price is paid. And it doesn't mean that our lives will be, I always say this, it doesn't mean our lives will be rosy now. No, we don't have any sin anymore. Yeah, everything's perfect, right? We. No, we still live in the world. We still have temptation. But we have to, like he said, we have to live in repentance. We have to repent of our sins and continue to live a life of repentance. Make them in, and you know what? We're going to fall for temptation. It happens. We all fall sooner or later. None of us is perfect. 
But the great thing is that we have, a, we have Christ who says, I've paid for that one too. Repent and go forward. Don't go back to it. If you find yourself in temptation, God provides a way out of it. The question is, are we going to take it? Are we going to take the way out of it? A couple things we can learn from these verses. First of all, God has his own timeline for fulfilling his will. I, I don't know about you, but man, I'm struggling right now. I am struggling with where we are as a country. I'm struggling with where, where we are as a world. And God's timeline, I'm like, where is God? What is he doing? Why is he allowing this? Even, I mean, and I don't care. I don't care if you believe the virus is the plague or if you don't believe the virus is real at all. That's a mute point. It really is. It's whether or not you believe that God is still in control. And if he is, he's allowing this to happen for a reason. I don't, you know, I can, I can, I can give you facts about, about the virus. I can give you facts about masks. I can give you facts about social distancing that prove it wrong. I can find you facts that prove it right. I believe there are people out there who are taking, I told you this, I told you this when this first started. If you go back and listen to my sermons, I told you what my fear was. My fear is not so much for the virus. My fear is for people who are taking advantage of it. And I believe that's where we are today. People are taking advantage of it. But if they're taking advantage of it and it's God's will that ultimately everything wins out, it goes according to his will, why is he allowing it to happen now? And I don't have an answer for that. But see, that's the great thing about it. I don't have to have an answer for it. All I have to do is trust him. So when Jeff says, take care of yourself, I do. But don't live in fear, I don't. Why? Because I trust Jesus. He's got this. And like, why well, aren't you afraid of getting the virus? Nope. I'm going to protect myself when I can. I'm going to not worry about it when I can't. If I get it, I get it. If I die, I, my kids and my wife hate to hear this. I die. It's my time. Our days are numbered. He has this. My problem today is his timing. I want him to tell me when it's going to happen. I want to tell him when everything's going to work out, right? Don't we all? Paul sat in jail for two years. Two years not knowing what, his, what was going to happen. He knew, but see, he, he knew God promised him that he would be preaching and that he had to go to Rome. So he knew God was going to take him to Rome. And if you read Romans, and if, if you read it, you'll see, and you read all his other letters that he wrote in Rome, you'll see he trusted Jesus all the way. That's what we've got to do today. We've got to rest in him and allow him to work out his will in his own timing. I hate it. I like to know what's going to happen, right? His ways are not our ways. We must be patient and act when we are supposed to and wait when we're not. No matter what our struggles are that we go through in this world, no matter how unfair the world seems, one day we will appeal to Caesar, which is Jesus, and he will judge the nations. Not me. He will. I won't judge all of you. He will. He's the judge. He's the perfect judge. But now we need to trust him for our salvation. True eternal judgment is coming. What we have today in this world, the persecution, the sin, the viruses, that's nothing compared to eternal separation from Christ. Right now, we, even those that don't believe in Jesus, they get the benefit of him, of, of what's called general, general grace. It's raining today, right? It doesn't just rain on those who are believers. It rains on everybody. Believer and non-believer alike. But one day, judgment is coming. The question is, will we be found in Christ? Or will we be judged? That's our choice. I'm going to ask Sherry to come up. Sherry's going to sing us a song. She's going to share with us. I've asked her to share 
And then what I want to do is I want to take some time. I want to spend some time in prayer. If, if, you, if, it's, if it's past 1130 and you need to go, fine. Just quietly get up and go. That's fine. If not, if you want to sit in your, your, cha- your seat and pray, that's fine. If you want to come up front and pray, that's fine. If you want me to pray with you, come up front. I'll be right up here. You can come up and pray, and I'll pray with you. I'll pray over you. I'll do whatever you need. But let's, we're going to spend some time in prayer afterwards. Pray for yourself. Pray for our country. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for whatever you need prayer for today. After Sherry's finished, that's what we want to do. And then I'll close us with a time of prayer. This song actually is a prayer. And so I would ask you to pray with me. Um, The first words to this song say, you have everything in your hands. You have everything under control. And I know each of us think of something, some circumstances, when we hear those words, just like Pastor Chris has been talking about. And I would ask you as we pray during the song to think of the, whatever came to your mind with those words in light of the words of the song. You have everything in your hands. You have everything under control. Whenever I praise you, I see who you really are. Whenever I praise you, I see you, <clears throat> I see you at the cross, and I hear you say, it is finished now. I see you as the King of Kings on your throne in your Father's kingdom. Oh, I see you. just waiting for your bride. You have everything in your hands. You have everything under control. For whenever I praise you, Cheers.